discovering what one's real value is, mm -hmm. that one really knows they have value, how do they do that? Well, first it starts with recognizing your beliefs. So we all have these little stories that we tell ourselves. The mind does not like to be kept quiet. So it chatters away all day long with all kinds of things. It really begins with being consciously aware of the chatter in our head and what that chatter is telling us. For a lot of us who were belittled and devalued and deworthed as children, it's first learning to listen to the words that we tell ourselves. And are those words loving or not? What's really fascinating is that any belief that causes you to feel small or worth less or belittling or shameful or fearful, all of that, for lack of a better word, is a lie. It's not true. Your truth is always loving. It will always encourage you. It will always tell you that you are worth your desires. When you can start to consciously listen to the voices inside of you, it, <laughs> some of us even have nicknames for those voices. <laughs> we all talk to ourselves, whether we want to admit it or not, we all do. And it's really becoming cautious, consciously aware of the messages that we tell ourselves and then changing the language that we use. So as we start to recognize these fearful, unloving, hurtful messages that we tell ourselves and start asking ourselves, is this true? What's fascinating is that your truth is actually here. It's in your heart and it's in your core. So we have all these negative beliefs that are always going on inside our heads that tell us that we're not worth what we desire. And our truth is that we are worth what we desire. Every single one of us is because you wouldn't have that desire unless you didn't also have all of the resources to make that desire become a reality. The playback tapes of childhood. Most of them are crap. <laughs> and, and those are the things that tie people up so badly most of the time yeah. and devalue them. Yeah. When they listen to those voices in their head, it's usually not their voice they're recalling. It's a siblings, a parents, or something like that. Yeah, or a teacher, or the minister, or some voice on TV. So what happens is that we hear these as children and we buy into them as truth before we've created our own beliefs. So most of what we believe are actually other people's beliefs that have been placed on us. You mentioned that the value in a person was a talent, an ability, a something already in them. Would you define that? Well, I think every one of us was born in perfection. And every one of us was born a clean slate where anything is anything becomes possible. It doesn't have anything to do with where we're born or what family we're born into. That's why you can see kids who are born in the most deplorable conditions become the most amazing people. Because who we are as a human being, our value isn't determined by where we're born. We're all born of the same value. It's a matter of us recognizing that value within ourselves and really owning it. So some tools on how to find that value are? <laughs> well, for starters, you have to first recognize that you have these blocks. Um, what happens is that we have our desires and then we have all of these beliefs that tell us we can't get our desires and so we're creating these glass ceilings if you will or these invisible barriers that block us from receiving that very thing we say we want we say that we want one thing but then our beliefs actually create a barrier to receiving those and some of the blocks that we have are things like having the courage to ask for a raise so you're at your job and there's a part of you that says, I should be making more money. But then the little voice in your head says, oh, but you don't have the courage to go up and ask for a raise. And so we don't because there's a voice that says, well, are you really worth that? You really don't have what it takes to go up and ask for the raise. You know, maybe you just sit here and do your job. Somebody will notice that you're doing a good job. Or we do the opposite, which is really one of the worst things we can do, which is sit around and complain about not making enough money. And if the boss is never going to give you a raise if you sit around and complain. 
when complaining is one of those beliefs that reinforces that we're not worth that thing that we say we want. So one of the other things that we tend to do is you feel like there's something that's blocking you in your life or you know you get a great job and you're on a high for a while and then you go down into this depression in between jobs. This happens a lot with people who are artists and who are actors. They go on this high when they first get the sales pitch, they first get the job, they first get the client and then they go and plummet into depression in between. And part of that is not really owning who you are as a person and your own worth. You have your worth attached to your work. And your worth doesn't have anything to do with your work. Who you are as a human being is without limits in value and without limits in personal worth. But we have this belief that our worth is attached to our work, which is why so many people run into depression and alcoholism and the need to do drugs in between these extreme highs and lows because they don't understand that, that your worth is an internal job. It's not attached to your work. But isn't it a fact that people that have good self-value usually have a better performance value? Yeah, I mean, it does definitely translate both ways. Yeah. Um, and so building your self-esteem and building your self-confidence, they build on top of each other. If you come out of an environment where you have absolutely no self-esteem, speaking from personal experience, <laughs> <laughs> it's a process. It took however many years for you to get to the deplorable state that you're in. It's not something that's going to be repaired overnight. However, for the person who really wants to repair their self-esteem and really own their true worth, it is a process that is well worth the effort to get to a point where you are absolutely and completely in love with life. So then if a person really loves their job and loves what they're doing, mm -hmm. they're probably going to be very good at it. Yes. Precisely. And if they go into it and they're so worried they may not be able to perform, then they may not be able to perform. Exactly. I mean, we create our own reality in that sense. If we don't believe that we're worth the money that we want to earn, we'll never break through to that next level. What you're saying is do what you love and the money will follow. It really does because you're pouring love into it and, and love isn't something that you get from someone else. It's the stuff that's inside of you. It's the stuff that we're all made of. And when we, when we can turn on that and ignite it and infuse it into our work, people want to do business with you because they find you irresistibly attractive. And so does money <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> it really is infusing love into what you do. So if you're going to work and you don't like your job and you're complaining about the boss, and you're complaining about your life, you're, what you're feeding into your life and feeding into your career, feeding into your work is fear of not being enough. A fear is amazingly, it's an amazing stronghold. It's powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful. Love is more powerful. If you do what you love and you love what you do, then one could possibly find their greatest talents by looking into themselves and asking themselves, what is it I love? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, but, but the reason a lot of us have lives that are, we're very frustrated with is because we're going through life based on should. What should I be doing? What is it everybody else that I should do? And it still plays into your self-worth because you don't feel good about the work that you do. But if you love what you do and it pays a little less, you can have a happier life. Much happier because you're fulfilled. You're no longer, to tr you're no longer trying to fill yourself up based on other people's expectations. That again is a self-worth, self-esteem issue. If you're living your life based on other people's expectations rather than following what calls to you from inside, you can't ever be fulfilled in that. Being filled up is doing something that feels right for you. You know, then your self-worth is built up with that because you feel good about what you're doing. It's not about making money so much as you were saying. A lot of us are out there making money, trying to make money to make us happy because we have this perception that money will buy happiness. And happiness is on the inside. Happiness is joy every day and doing what you're love or doing what you love and, and the money becomes inconsequential because you love what you're doing but you still are providing a valid service right and, and you're still being compensated for it so 
So we all have an ability, a talent, a something that is a valid service to humanity that we love if we'll seek it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really owning the value of who you are and what that is that's inside of you. And owning that instead of trying to be what everybody else expects us to be. As long as we live our lives based on the perceptions and expectations of everyone around us, rather than really honoring ourselves, it's impossible to find that happiness that every one of us is ultimately seeking. So then if we forfeit who we are for someone else's acceptance, we're really losing big time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it will continue to drain on your self-esteem and your self-worth. Yeah. And it doesn't get any better, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> So the more you yeah. forfeit, the, the less self-esteem you have, the less self-respect you have. The next thing you know, you're in a state of depression and don't know how you got that way. Right. And we have this belief that our happiness comes from someone else. We're always trying to buy that happiness from outside ourselves. And we're always trying to buy self-esteem from outside ourselves. If I get this new car, if I get this new house, if I get this new boyfriend, if I get rid of this husband and get another husband, if I get rid of that job and get another job, then I'll be happy. And ultimately, it's an inside job. And so instead of trying to find our self-worth in everyone around us, it's a matter of stopping and taking a look at who we are on the inside. And, and it's a self-improvement process. We have to be willing to take a look at all of the beliefs that we have and analyze them, whether they're true or not, and then go through a lot of finding gratitude for what is in our past to be grateful for and i guarantee you there's always something to be grateful for no matter how bad your story is some of us have some really really hurtful stories and not a lot of happy things to recall and yet there's always something to be grateful for in there and that starts to open up the window of possibility it starts to turn on a spark of hope that there's something else out there and the self-worth can start to make its way in. But those yeah. who have survived physically, emotionally, mentally from the greatest tragedies often bring forth the greatest gifts because of it, not in spite of it. Yeah. There are people that really do that. It's a choice. They don't realize it's a choice, but it's a choice. Mm -hmm. How you respond how does one help people understand that it's a choice? Well, as one of my favorite teachers says, those of us with the most painful stories have the greatest ability to heal the world. And it really becomes a choice of whether, number one, whether we decide to look at our story with a new perspective or keep telling the same old story. We all have our stories and we can continue to regurgitate that story the same old way that causes us to continue to suffer in the story or we can take it and look at it from a completely different perspective that empowers us. You know, one of the things I always say is that our story has the ability to either be chains that we drag along behind us or it can give us the wings to fly. It's entirely up to us to see our story from a new perspective. You have to get to the point where you choose it. You have to choose to let it take you down or to get stronger. It's a choice. Right. So most of the time we're living unconsciously through fear. And as long as we're living unconsciously through fear, it will keep us in suffering. So we have to choose, just finally say, you and I am done. I am so done with being unhappy. How do I fix it? That's when the choice points start when you start consciously choosing something else. So if one has a tragic history, they can choose not to be a victim. Mm -hmm. And it will change their life. Yes. And they find their strength where? It's inside. It's very true. Yeah. Sometimes the fire is exactly what creates the steel that causes you never again to bend yeah. to someone else's whim. Galvanized. Galvanized. <laughs> so what would you tell a teenage kid today who is trying so hard 
to be accepted by all of their peers that are doing so many destructive things. What would you tell that child? I'm putting myself back there because I was one of those kids who was um, extremely, I'm going to say bullied, but that's kind of the hot word right now. I was terrorized by my peers as a teenager. And, you know, physical abuse, I ended up, you know, eventually being raped by a couple of my schoolmates. So, I, I, although I understand that it hurts to see a bad text with your name on it, they're not getting their head shoved in the toilet and beat up in the locker room. Although it does hurt, regardless of how traumatizing the trauma is, it does hurt. What I would say to those teenagers, and which is what I teach my kids, is that you need to learn how to love yourself unconditionally. And most people have no idea what unconditional love is. And because we've been sold this misperception, a lot of us, you know, it stems from, or for a lot of us, this God that is supposedly unconditionally loving with a big long list of conditions. So most of us have no idea what unconditional love really is. You know, even parents who say they love their kids unconditionally, but there's still conditions attached to it. And so I think what's really important is that we as individuals know how to love ourselves without condition and without restriction, that we are our best friends, and that, um, that everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but I am not defined by someone else's opinions of me. You are not defined by someone else's opinions of you. You are who you are. You be who you are. You love yourself no matter what. What you're saying is someone else's rude behavior toward you mm -hmm. or abuse toward you or unkindness toward you says more about them than it will ever say about Absolutely. you. Absolutely. It's always their stuff. It's their stuff they're projecting onto you. So don't internalize it. Yeah. Realize what, it. Yeah, because as soon as you start internalizing other people's beliefs, that's where the hurt is. If you can understand that it's their stuff they're trying to deflect onto you and you can just say, I'm not going to take ownership of that. That's their stuff. So it's not only physical abuse, but it's emotional, spiritual abuse, right. degradation, name calling, degrading. All of that is really about who they are. And if you can see that and learn to see that when you're young, mm -hmm. it'll save you a lot of pain. A lot of pain. I mean, we even see that happening in the workplace right now where people are really rude and hurtful to each other at work. Well, in my case, I just leave that job. <laughs> I'm sorry, I refuse to let anybody abuse me. <laughs> right. But um, that for me, that's self-honoring. Make a choice that honors you first. Don't allow people to beat you up. And understand that when people are causing you suffering, it's because of their own suffering they're projecting onto you. It's always other people's stuff. And I refuse to take responsibility for other people's actions. So when we're little kids, without realizing it, we internalize other people's stuff, and then we judge ourselves according to their hatred, anger, insecurity, fear, whatever that little problem is, or big one. Right. And then we carry that baggage around and cripple ourselves with the load. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the things I say is that no one can ever abuse us nearly as harshly as we abuse ourselves. So we hate ourselves for what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We punish ourselves for what we didn't do because we assume that that's the only way we can be accepted. Yeah. So we buy into other people's BS. Belief systems. <laughs> <laughs> yes, belief systems, of course. <laughs> even here in America, even here in California where women are pretty darn close to equal, there's still a pervasive belief that we are worth less. And that is shifting. Part of that is that as women, we have to first own that within ourselves, that we are just as worth, worth just as much as anyone else. Then that belief, that new belief gets fed into the greater consciousness. And that's why it's taken a while for these beliefs to evolve because Evolution takes time, and each one of us believing something new feeds into that belief of the greater consciousness. 
So this really starts with teaching little girls, not that we're better than boys or that we're better than anybody else. That's not what it is because that becomes a, an over and under thing again. It's teaching that we are worth just as much, that we are just as valuable, that we are limitless in our value. I tell my kids every day, I love you no matter what. I love you just as you are. And so they know that. They, they are free to explore and free to do whatever they want and they are loved no matter what. And they are just as valued as anybody else. What they choose to do for a living then is based on what they love, not based on expectation. It's our differences, our differences that create the great values because if we're exactly alike, one of us is unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> So the differences cross the bridges, create expansion, a different world, a different view, a greater garden of value, mm -hmm. a greater landscape of beauty. Our differences, not our similarities. It's mutual respect of those differences you're exactly, talking about. Exactly, exactly. So that first has to stem from self-respect. So part of the issue with girls is that girls, a lot of girls, hopefully this is changing, but a lot of girls haven't been taught self-respect. You and I were taught to respect men, respect our elders, respect our teachers, respect our parents, completely void of this concept of self-respect completely void of the concept of everything that it means to love yourself. I was raised with the belief that loving myself was a bad thing, like it was evil to love myself because we have this misperception that ego is the same as loving yourself and they are two very different things. Right. They're actually complete opposites. opposites. Ego is based in fear and the perception of other people, how we're going to be perceived by other people. It's actually fear-based. Self-love is genuinely loving ourselves no matter what. Self-love then equates to self-respect. Yes. To so when we love ourselves, we honor ourselves, we respect ourselves, we forgive ourselves, we cherish ourselves. And in that, we learn how to protect ourselves when we need protection. And all of that stems from self-love. And it's not something that's being taught. Love yourself first. We can't give what we don't have. And yet we're so many of us were taught completely the opposite, that it's not okay to think highly of yourself. It's not okay to love yourself. <laughs> and that's what we need more than anything is to start when we're really small and knowing that it really is okay to love everything about you. And it doesn't mean that you're better than anybody else. It just means I am perfectly okay with who I am. Wow, what a different concept that is from what we were raised with. Yeah. To love ourselves was evil oh. and selfish and egotistical and bad and wicked. To even like yourself. To even like yourself. <laughs> I loathed myself. I hated myself so much I tried to kill myself. <laughs> well, that's sort of a tradition, wasn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I fantasized about it for about two years. <laughs> didn't even have the guts to do that. I, I really, that was another one I beat myself up over. That I didn't even have the guts to kill myself. Well, we're sure glad that you didn't because the concept of punishing and degrading a child to that extreme. Punishment and degrading and condemning a person mm -hmm. has no value whatsoever except one of control and maliciousness. It has no other value. Right. So it's a logical thing if people really knew that to degrade and to devalue a human being really degrades and devalues them because it says more about them than anything else. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that as long as we degrade and devalue other people, it, it, it's part of the, it continues that pervasive belief that some people are worth less and worth more. And we'll always have that dichotomy of lower class, poor people and the rich class because there is that belief that some people need, need to be degraded. And when you're raised in an environment and a childhood where you're constantly bombarded with degradation, your ability as an adult to rise up out of that is much more difficult. It's possible. You and I have proven that it's possible. Yes, it is possible. It's a lot harder than if you had parents who were supportive. <laughs> it's a little more work. It's a little more challenging. 
And you and I are here to teach other people that you can. It doesn't matter what your story looks like. You can rise above it and create a life you absolutely love. Sometimes in the depth of the most rotten story comes the greatest incentive and inspiration to get out of it. <laughs> Yeah, so it's so funny. People would say to me, oh, that you were so courageous to leave as a teenager. That took so much courage. And I would laugh and say, no, I was just desperate. <laughs> but I had this great insight a couple of years ago that sometimes that's what courage looks like. Yeah. A lot of people say that if you're afraid, you can't be courageous. I object. I think that courage means you're going to go fear and all, no matter what. You're going despite yeah. it all. Yeah, very much so. A lot of times courage comes out of desperation, that you are so desperate to make a change in the world, whether it's your personal world or the world as a whole, that you will do whatever it takes. That's what courage is. Courage is actually based in love, not fear. Yes. Yes. So fear is, would, would keep you stuck in that place. And courage says, not anymore. I refuse to be afraid anymore, and it pushes through that barrier. And it's in there. It's in every one of us. It's what allows us to break through those barriers. If we didn't have courage, we would have never gotten up and walked. We would have never crawled. We would have never spoken our first word and tried to be understood. And it's there, just waiting for us to say, okay, I'm ready for another breakthrough. I am done with my life being like this. I deserve more than this. I am worth more than this suffering. So basically what happens to the human being when they start forfeiting who they are from the time they're very young and they don't even know they're forfeiting mm -hmm. and they become less and less and less of who they are and that's what the problem is because they soon lose track. They only believe the negative compound fractures heaped upon them. Mm -hmm. They have nothing to do with reality. Right. And to get back to who they are takes courage. But if they can really see that, they'll stop mm -hmm. forfeiting their hopes, their dreams, their future, their talent, their ability to please someone that has no respect for them anyway. Right. Because somebody that would do that to you has no respect for you. And ultimately, they don't have any respect for themselves. Of course, of course. But <laughs> if someone was... had a self-loving relationship, they would never take that out on someone else. True. It starts with them, yeah. and it rolls over on everybody else. Yeah. But the victim is the child. Right. Yeah, and what's really sad about that is that also, is the, also the perpetrator is. In their own suffering, in their own way, they also are a victim of their own suffering. And they're projecting that onto the child because they have no idea how to heal their own suffering. So then there's another concept. One cannot destroy, demean, and be cruel to someone without really hurting themselves, can they? Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It's impossible. 